A lot of folks have asked me, why can't the United States, I'm, I'm shifting gears a little bit here, why can't the United States replace what China makes with Mexican manufacturing? What's the problem here? You know, there's tons of skilled laborers in Mexico. I know we have to build factories and stuff like that. There's the, there's the whole, that whole idea, but it's not, it doesn't seem impossible to have Mexico replace quite a bit of that. What's wrong with that? Let me give you the good idea? and then the bad. So first okay. the good. We can, we are, and we will. Okay. Uh, the industrial build out in Mexico is epic. And the Mexicans on average are more skilled than Chinese laborers and they're one third the cost. Huh. So there, there are very, very few economic manufacturing sectors where the Mexicans are not already the low cost, high quality producer compared to China. Uh, and so that is proceeding apace. Uh, problems, number one, there's only 130 million Mexicans. You know, they've got one tenth the population of China, so they can't do it all. So it has to be a group effort with the United States and Vietnam and others uh, involved. Uh, so we have to basically relocate a whole lot of industrial plant. You don't do that overnight, no matter how right. disparate your situation is. Uh, second, electronics. What makes East Asia dominant in electronics is they've got a labor system that taps 12 different labor markets with different skill sets, all in close proximity. So you do the injection molding in one place, the die cast in another, you make the wires in one place, the wiring harness in another, you process the copper in one place, you make the semiconductor in another. And it's doing all of these things differently, efficiently, and then bringing them together for assembly at yet another place. In North America, we have two labor markets. We've got the U.S. and Canada, which are broadly the same, high tech. And then we've got Mexico, which does middle manufacturing very well. It's the delta between them that gives you good economies of scale and network effects for electronics manufacturing because there's so many steps. Well, only in the U.S.-Mexico border region do we get that interface. So we don't have the 12-step labor market that the Asians have, which means that we're going to have to retool everything that we bring back in the electronics space. Uh, in order to do it at scale. And that's going to look very different. And we are going to have to make that up as we go. And that will probably be the economic sector where we feel the most pain from the changes because it's going to take the longest. It almost seems like Mexico needs its own Mexico. It does. It's called <laughs> Colombia. Okay, got it. <laughs> yeah, so Mexico and Colombia both have Atlantic and Pacific port. Uh, both have Atlantic and Pacific ports. And Colombia is very similar in economic structure to where Mexico was 15 to 25 years ago. So more skilled than their price point would suggest. Uh, and the Colombians are absolutely going to be an indelible part of whatever comes next for the greater NAFTA system. Uh, it'll take them a little bit longer to get up and running than it did the Mexicans because Mexico, it's right up on the U.S. border. So it's very easy for American entrepreneurs to reach south, find partners and build out. Uh, Colombia is not just in a different continent. Uh, most of the population lives on the sides of mountains. So you've got tropics in the lowlands and snow caps and tundra at the top. People live in the middle. And that makes the infrastructure question a really important one. It's not that the infrastructure is not in place. It is. But it's not built out to supply and support a mass manufacturing culture, which is what we need them to do. That's going to take some time, too. Yeah, I, th I think that's it. a lot of people will go, why, why do you hate Chinese people? One, I married one. So, you know, Trump card. But also, this is one of the most pro China things you can do is sort of be anti authoritarian because and I said this about Russians a few weeks ago on the show. Russia has some of the most talented, hardworking, intelligent, just inventive people that have ever existed on planet Earth. They've just had their potential mercilessly stamped out for literally the entirety of the last several centuries, right? Through the, from the czar to the Soviet Union to now through Putin. They just the, the the that's why when you see these Russians that have immigrated, for example, to the United States, well, some of this is biased because I live in Silicon Valley, but they all are brilliant and work at Google. And like same with Belarus, like our neighbors are all from this area and they're all just incredible folks and just talented stock. And I used to live, I spent a summer in Ukraine and it was the same thing. I was just always blown away by how educated and amazing people were. And same thing with China. You know, everybody that you meet from there, aside from government authorities and people who have just been sort of sucking on the teat of the CCP and are, are given those jobs uh, because of corruption, those people are in absolutely incredible. And of course, what happens? You have to kiss up to the party. You lose opportunities to get a job or an education because somebody else is related to somebody. And so you miss out. 
these regimes have got to go because corruption is straight up inefficient. It's not just unfair, it's inefficient. It's like an externality, to use an economics term, like organized crime. People go, oh, it's awesome. It's only awesome if you are the recipient of this. Every single other person is bearing the cost. And that is a problem when you're talking about 1.3 billion people who are on an economic upswing in spite of Xi Jinping, I might add, you know, in many ways. And we want to see countries like China and Russia, for that matter, join the global economy and do really well. We just want to see them do that without threatening, threatening to frickin' nuke Europe so that they can have uh, a larger backyard. Yeah, you said it perfectly. And again, I would like to, just for people not familiar with me, the reason I do what I do is because of the thousands, now thousands of Chinese people that have reached out to me personally that cannot talk about this. So when you're, you know, when you say, I hate to make analogy, I hate to make comparisons here because they're both in horrible situations. But when you see the thousands of Russian protesters go out, out there on the street to protest the war, and a lot of them, what, 8,000 something at this point getting arrested, you couldn't even see that in China. You couldn't even see 100 right, in China, if something like this were, was to happen. And it's not because people don't care. It's because the people that reach out to me personally have inspired me to speak about the atrocities of the Chinese government because they can't do it. They can't do it online. They can barely do it in private at this point without some something leaking out there. And the punishments in China are much worse than Russia, right? This is a tight, it's basically at this point, you can, uh, a good analogy I can use is like North Korea with money. It has the tech, it has the buses, it has the high-speed rails, it has all the bells and whistles to make it not look like some sort of Stalinist dystopia. But the reality is the way that the government works, it is a Stalinist dystopia. The way that the surveillance state works, the way that the cameras track you everywhere, the way your social status is determined by your party connections, all of that stuff is very reminiscent to North Korea. When I have people reach out to me and send me emails saying, please keep doing what you're doing, we don't have a voice. And when I meet people at protests here in America, when I go to anti-Asian hate protests and talk to people about how you know, they tell me the, the biggest for, uh, form of Asian hate in the entire world is the Chinese government that have made me and my family flee over here. We didn't want to leave. I didn't want to leave, right? People have to flee to avoid persecution for just even, not even just religious freedoms, just basic personal freedoms, like freedom of speech. So that's what keeps me going. That's why I'm inspired to do what I can. And that's why I'm a little bit, I'm, I'm usually an optimist, but I'm a little bit concerned about this fair-weather friend kind of partnership that Russia and China have formed uh, with their governments right now. Yeah, I mean, the, the reality is you're one guy and you're going against a state like China. I don't want to, I, I, I'm trying to think of a diplomatic way to say this, but the truth is if they really want to do something, I'm, the resistance you can put up is pretty yeah. minimal, right? Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, you know, I, before I book, um, I mean, there's a lot of struggle before the book came out. You know, I consult people who in, you know, this kind of situation, like, you know, Bill Browder. He Bill wrote, Browder. He wrote a book. Yeah. yeah, Browder wrote a book on Red Notice, right? Actually, he's a friend. I consult him. I consult him, like, how should I arrange my security, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, but reality is, you know, me versus a state, you know, a, a party with 90 million members, second largest or control, the second largest economy, that's absolutely nothing I can do if you want me dead or they want me anything, right? That's very little I can do. But in that regard, I have to say, America is the safest country in the world. I mean, I do, you know, I, I have been in dialogue with the FBI in the US. They, they are very good compared to, you know, what I've seen and experienced in Europe. Really? So you're because it's another you're... class about. It's an really? they are they are protect they are protective, lot better intelligence, and they're willing to do things about it. That's interesting. I have uh, I'm trying to think of what I can say here. I have had some experience with Chinese intelligence operations and the FBI in the United States, and they are they take things seriously. Where you would think, oh, they're not going to believe me. They're not going to care, and they do not only believe you, but they seem they will they are on it. They are, and it was surprising yeah. to me too, because you don't usually yeah. expect efficient police response from the U.S. government about something that sounds kind of insane, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, given my experience, I, I really have to say. I mean, I tell them them myself. I mean, I tell the Brits and I tell the you know the Europeans, you know, the American FBI just another class above you guys. That's interesting, but you're still UK based, so yeah. Come on, Scotland Yard, get on it, right? Are there CC? I mean, I know there's a lot of CCP agents in the U.S., especially in the United Kingdom. Do they harass you at all? So far, so far, nothing has happened. 
So we're like, cross our finger, like keep it that way. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. Y you were friendly with many people in Xi Jinping's inner circle. How do you assess his character? Do you think he's a, a socialist zealot like many people seem to think, or is he more uh, on the other end of the spectrum? First of all, I think, you know, he, he really, he's a second generation. You know, he sees himself as an emperor to rejuvenate the dynasty. Mm -hmm. That's how he sees himself when he come on, you know, when he get on a job. And then 20, 10 years ago, 2012. And then so he is in a, he has a vision. Well, I don't know about vision. He wants to rejuvenate and re-engineer the entire country to more to the ideals of the Communist Party. And then to, to give Communist Party such vitality, they can rule forever over China. I mean, they essentially they actually put it in you know, the change the constitution again and put it in the, there. They know the Communist Party going to rule over China forever, mm -hmm. essentially. And that's what he wants to do. And that's, that is the, for, I think for everybody, including Chinese in China, that's the most dangerous thing because he is re-engineering the entire country in every dimension. And then we, every one of us don't know what's the end state he has in mind. I'm not sure even he knows where's the end state in mind, he has in mind. But he's definitely, um, you know, whether you look at the tech industry, the education, the industry, the state, the private economy, the relationship with the West, you know, with America, you know, and then the history engineering the country, restructuring the country in every dimension in his, in his view, that's for the longevity of the party's control over China. And that's the, you know, where, where it's going to end. That's the, you know, that's the most dangerous thing. Yeah, especially looking at what's happening with Russia and Putin. It's like a lot of times dictators end game is, well, I'm going to die and I don't really know what's going to happen after that. And it's like, uh, instability, infighting, possibly war, uh, hard to say. But these guys aren't necessarily thinking about how it's going to end for everyone else. That's not really in their nature, is it? China's, in Xi Jinping's mind, that, China, that the relationship with Russia and Putin is this, is an enemy of my enemy is my friend. So in his mind, in CCP's mind, the biggest threat to their, to, yeah. to their existence is America, is the United States of America. So enemy of my enemy is my friend. So who are their friends? North Korea is their friend. Yeah. Iran is their friend. I mean, they signed a contract for 500 billion to buy oil from Iran, right? And, and Russia is their friend, right? So, you know, so that's no, no way they're going to ditch. They're going to manage the relationship with the rest of the world, but they're not going to ditch Russia despite everything's happening right now with Ukraine. Yeah, for sure. No, that totally makes sense. How can other countries expect America to take the reins and leadership on global pandemics, climate change, or any other crazy existential threat if we are potentially headed for a much more nationalist or even an isolationist United States? Well, I mean, the question is, does America have to take the lead in everything? Uh, I mean, when the world is dominated by a single superpower or two superpowers, back when it was the U.S. and the Soviet Union, I mean, all of the institutions and architecture are going to be aligned to that. So the U.S. builds the U.N. and the U.S. builds the IMF and the U.S. builds the World Trade Organization. When the Americans are less interested in doing that, not because we're not a superpower anymore, but because we're just much more divided, we're much more inward focused, there's a lot more, you know, sort of questions about what America even stands for, what our national values are. Um, that doesn't mean that you don't have leadership, but it does mean you don't have a singular global order. Mm -hmm. It means that different global orders will emerge to respond to different issues, and the leadership will be very different as well. So, for example, if we're going to talk about... Um, you know, Russia and Ukraine, or we were going to talk about the global security order, the United States is still by far the dominant power militarily in the world. The U.S. outspends the next nine countries combined. Um, and that means that if something is going to get done from a global military perspective, if the Americans don't lead it, you ain't getting a global response. You might get a regional response, you might get a local response, but you can't get, there would be, Ukraine would not be happening if it wasn't for the Americans. The U.S. are providing by far the most military equipment, training, materiel to Ukraine. And if it wasn't for that, it'd be a very, very different outcome, okay? But if you want to talk about leadership on climate, um, 
you're not talking about the United States. You might be talking about California for some, for some regulatory pieces. You might be talking about Texas for some others. Um, you'd be talking about some of the banks that are taking the lead in shifting away from fossil fuels to renewables, and a lot of those are American institutions. But you wouldn't be talking about Washington and the U.S. federal government, nor would you be talking about China and the Chinese national government. You'd be talking about the European Union, for example, which is doing far more in setting the rules for how we think about the future of global carbon emissions and global energy. The Saudis used to be much more important. They won't be in 20, 30 years. That's pretty clear. Um, if we were to talk about global trade, the United States doesn't have a global trade policy anymore because most Americans, Democrats and Republicans, oppose free trade in this environment, which means that the trade environment is becoming much more fragmented and multipolar. China's leading some of it, America's leading other pieces, Europe's leading others, Japan, you name it. So it doesn't mean that you can't get leadership, but the leadership will be much more messy and it'll be much more differentiated depending on what we're talking about. People aren't used to talking about the idea that we could be living simultaneously in worlds with radically different types and forms of leadership on the basis of what we're talking about. They assume, well, it's either the U.S. or, well, okay, now it's China. No, it's not. It, it used to be the U.S. and the Soviets. Then it was the U.S., and now it's a whole bunch of stuff, and it depends on what you're talking about. That's, that's what's so fascinating about the future of the world that we're heading into. None of us has ever lived in a world where the largest economy, so in this case China, is governed by authoritarians. But that seem, it seems like that's where we're headed. Do you think this necessarily puts us on a collision course for conflict or war? So, number one, um, China is not yet the largest economy. Right, not yet. They were expected to be the largest economy in 2028. That was before the pandemic. Now it looks more like 2030, 2032. But if it turns out that China's sustainable growth patterns for the next 10, 20 years aren't 5 6%, but because of massive corporate debt and challenges in attracting international investment and massive demographic challenges, the population has already maxed out. It's now decreasing which you know, happens in South Korea and Japan, but they're already rich. China's not. Right. They're aging like crazy, yeah. not having enough kids, can't come back from that. You can have a 10-child policy, but it's not going to matter at this Doesn't point. It doesn't matter. So, I mean, if, if, if Shanghai, uh, the Shanghai report that came out back in May is correct, and China by 2100 is, is, is going to be sub-600 million in population. Wow. As opposed to 1.4 billion now, I mean, then maybe China gets to be the largest economy in the world for five or 10 or 20 years, but then it won't be. And it's possible if China only grows at two or 3% on average that they never actually become the largest economy in the world. But let's assume they become the largest economy in the world. That still doesn't mean that they're the biggest military in the world or have mm -hmm. the most capacity or are willing to spend on that because they're still a poor country that is going to have demands of a middle class that will be outsized. Now, there's another question to ask, which is who controls the commanding heights of the world's advanced technologies? Now, right now, there are only two countries that really matter, the U.S. and China. But a lot of the biggest actors in technology aren't actually government actors. They're private sector actors. And some of those are aligned with governments, but some of them aren't. I mean, Apple is much more of a global company than it's an American company. Microsoft is much more an American and democracies company than it's a global company. That's interesting. How would we think about that in China in five or 10 years time? Probably more aligned with the government, but if the government desperately needs these companies to make money and they'll lose talent if they try to control them and they start, well, then maybe they have to balance a little bit. So even here, this becomes a much more complicated question than just a world where the only thing that matters is whose economy is number one, and that government will therefore have all the power, and they're the ones that get to drive the future of the world. That, that's not where we're headed. What can average citizens do listening to this? You know, we're talking about facing a hostile Chinese Communist Party. Uh, what, what, what can I do? You know, I don't really know. And I'm, I study this stuff, I look at it, and what do I do, just not, not invest in Alibaba? I mean, what, where do I begin? 
Well, I mean, that's a that's a good start. Don't invest in Alibaba. Don't don't kind of succumb to the corporate, you know, uh, methodology, but also locally, you know, the, the, the first thing, and this is why I got out, number one, you can't really speak out when you're um, wearing the uniform. So I had to get out and kind of begin to, so I'm trying to help educate people. And I'm just trying to give you an on-ramp onto, um, onto, uh, into an area where you can start to learn for yourself. And you need to read, you need to communicate, you need to ask questions. And then locally, you can begin to do things that help get at the problem. One of the biggest problems that we have um, from a political perspective, uh, and this is whether you're on the right or the left, is the political system is not working for the American people. And, and um, you know, one of the, um, there's a good book out there called The Politics Industry, where um, it was written by um, a businessman, a businesswoman from Wisconsin, who had an epiphany that you know the the, the political system, the two po the two uh, political parties were actually not um, working on behalf of the citizens; they were working on behalf of the party constituencies, the donors, and you know the the party establishment. And that in order to break that up, that you needed to create a voting system that allowed for more people to choose the representative. So rather than if you're in a blue district, the base of the uh, of the Democratic Party ch choosing the candidate and that candidate winning the general election by the by uh, power of that um, base or in a red district having that happen, that you needed to have a way to have voting so that you could break down those those lines so that, you know, Republicans and Democrats would have to, you know, come together in a candidate that they both it's not the not the number one choice for either one of them, but maybe it's the number three choice uh, for either one of them. And because it's the number three choice, that person listens to both sides. Right. So, you know, political innovation is what is is kind of the subtitle of the book, The Politics Industry. But it's looking at how do we get back to where bipartisanship actually exists at the highest levels of government and they work on behalf of the American people who have been complaining about the fact that all of our factories are gone and we don't have jobs. You know, I've been on a factory floor that's been broken down. So political act, uh, activism but not necessarily partisanship is what I'm talking about here. How do we get our political system to actually work better? You can do that at the local level. I, you know, focused on it as I want to start a company that would protect people from, uh, you know, influence of their data or stealing of their data or, you know, to, that allow them to maintain a, 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 a connection. I did that in technology. There are so many, we're in a free country. You can look at the problem, you can learn and study it, and then you can go take your, where you think that your skills and your talents and your passion are best suited to go after, you know, what's the goal? And the goal is really the preservation of our, of our Constitution. It, it, it is the thing, that document is the thing that gives us the freedom to do the things that we, that we want to do to kind of express ourselves. I know this topic is a little bit depressing. It's a little bit scary. And I want to reiterate, that, again, I know we said this at the top of the show, that this isn't about the Chinese people. It's about the Chinese Communist Party. The, the biggest victims of the Chinese Communist Party has always been the Chinese people. I mean, you're talking about 15 to 80 million dead under Mao, and that's just the beginning. People, uh, genis Uyghur genocide in Xinjiang, and that's just, again, just the beginning. So I want to reiterate that because I, you know, we have Chinese fans and people who are live in America or Canada that are Chinese and they they're like what the hell man you know what I do uh, I want people to realize that we're fighting for freedom free market uh, fair play as much as possible and uh, and and not trying to single out any particular ethnicity here I just really think that the the Chinese people and China have such high potential I mean this should have been their opening up and liberalization and economic development should have been one of the greatest things to ever happen in the history of the world, and instead, it looks like all we did was create a monster, which is really sad. So hopefully, we can turn that around. Well, yeah, and, and my heart goes out to um, the people of China, the people of Hong Kong, the people of Taiwan. They're who I'm concerned about. And you're right. You know, um, freedom is is really powerful as an idea, but if you're never allowed to even realize that it's something that's possible, that you've, it's not even an idea that's in your lexicon, and that's, you know, essentially what the Chinese Communist Party has been able to do, um, you, through its propaganda and media, media and education, you know, it really becomes difficult. And so it's nothing, to, they're, they're not, they're, you know, 
I get this in my Twitter feed. Oh, but it's, it's also the Chinese people. No, the Chinese people don't know any better. They can't know any better because the Chinese Communist Party has created such an effective system. And it is a tragedy. And, you know, I think we, uh, in being greedy and taking their money and allowing them to influence us, um, are doing a complete disservice not only to our own citizens, but to the citizens of China and the citizens of Taiwan. I think we are perpetuating their enslavement. In the case of ta Taiwan, we're aiding and abetting their future enslavement. And, you know, much better for us to recognize this, what is going on and to begin the, the, the long, hard process, as we did with the Soviet Union, of 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 pushing back and saying no we are not, we are going to meet you at every loc at, at every area and we're going to we're going to be there to say no we we will not stand for this and and we should do that because not only will that be um, better for the chinese people but our own democracy cannot exist in a world that is almost all author authoritarian